All right, here we go. It is our last embryology lecture. It is the fall of 2022. It's week 10. Apologize in advance for my voice. I got a little bug this morning. It was the second quarter, not the fifth quarter. There's like five people were sick in second quarter. Anyway, so we were talking about the nodal cord last time. We didn't get all the way through that, so we're going to finish the nodal cord story. And we're going to pretty much build the neural tube, and that's where we'll cut it off. Uh, I encourage you to go to my YouTube channel and look at the other videos I have, because there are there is more to embryology than just this, which takes longer to get through. But I think with the, the information I've given you through here, you'll be able to figure out. This is all the hard stuff, I think, in embryology. The other stuff is just memorizing what came from what. And all right, here we go. So here's where we left off. We we had built, well, we built a primitive streak quite a while ago. And we started, last lecture, we formed the trilaminar disc with ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. Uh, we already talked about a, and remember, this is the nodal cord here. We talked about how cells on the, the periphery of the ectoderm, and back then it was called the, the epiblast cells, how they move in. The primitive streak is already built, so they don't have anywhere to go, so they dive down. And we talked about how some of them dive down, and they don't spread out. They just go straight forward in a very, fairly narrow band. And the first anterior migrators, if you could call them that, um, they piled up to form something called the precordal plate. And we talked about that. It's very important for the formation of the brain, the early formation of the brain and other things. And now we started talking about a second wave of anterior migrating cells. And this is going to form the nodal cord. And these cells will bump right into the precordal plate and form a solid structure here. And that's about where we left off the story. And remember, at the same time this is going on, we have mesoderm cells. Some of these, these epiblast cells are coming through the primitive streak, and they're going out and forming another layer, a mesoderm layer here. And we said some of them get exposed to very high levels of nodal, and they go all the way through, and they knock that, that hypoblast layer out, and they replaced it as the endoderm. And then we said that the, the very top layer, the epiblast cells, nobody, they just kind of morphed into that third germ layer called ectoderm cells. So that's pretty much where we left off the story. Um, I, don't, I can't remember if we got this far or not, but the next thing that happens after this solid nodal cord is formed is it hollows out. So we form a nodal cordal canal here. Uh, that connects right up through the primitive pet, through the primitive node. And remember the big picture here. Remember, this is all the amnion here. Amniotic fluid is in here. And this is beneath this. This is the the secondary yolk sac uh, that has kind of a saline-like fluid. There's some substances float around in here that we don't need to know about. Okay, so notochordal canal was built. And we're still, we haven't, got a mature nodal cord yet. We need a mature nodal cord, mature cells, to be able to form the neural plate. Eventually, these cells, and we'll talk about this today, the cells above are going to be morphed into the neural plate, which is ultimately going to give rise to your brain and your spinal cord. So before we can do that, we need to make a mature nodal cord, and that's where we are now. So we have a, a canal that's formed here. All right, so the next thing that happens, uh, you can read about it here, but let's just look at the picture and see what happens. Next thing that happens is the these cells right here, uh, they degenerate away into nothing. So we basically lose this layer of notochordal cells. And then the notochordal canal is just connected to uh, the, uh, the endoderm here. Um, and this is a mixture. It says hypoblast because remember we're f we're just forming the endoderm here, so it's probably a mixture of hypoblast and endoderm cells. But anyway, these cells are gone, and so the canal is right up 
against these, these hypoblaster endoderm cells. And then what's going to happen is these, let's take these three right here, they're going to disintegrate. And we won't worry about all the process of doing that. But if you punch a hole in these, this pink layer and you punch a hole in this, this hypoblast layer or endoderm layer, you got yourself an opening here. And that is called the neuroenteric canal. The neuroenteric canal. So that's a key kind of buzzword. But with the neuroenteric canal formed, now we can see we have a connection between the amniotic cavity and the amniotic fluid and the secondary yolk sac here and its fluid. And remember, this is not filled with yolk like, like birds and other type of creatures are. We don't have yolk. We have a fluid in there, but um, we said it's important for, for forming early blood cells. But, but anyway, so we have a canal here. So if you're Ant-Man and you're Ant-Man submarine, you could take your submarine and you could go back and forth between there. Um, and it turns out that's really important uh, in the formation of the spinal cord. And I, I took a lot of this crazy complicated stuff, and we're just going to get to the facts here. If this canal does not reform, and we'll take you through the, some of the steps of reforming it, or, or if, this, if this endoderm doesn't reform, and if this neuroenteric canal doesn't close right here, you can get some nasty deformities. And one of them is a split spinal cord. So some people have, or most of us just have one spinal cord, right? But some people are born with two spinal cords, and that is not a good setup. All kinds of problems happen with that. Uh, and that, of course, has a word. Uh, it's called diastematomyelia. Diastomatomyelia. Sometimes it's just called diastomatomyelia, but I'll call it the full name, diastomatomyelia. And that's a fancy word for, for saying split spinal cord. Um, some people just call it split spinal cord malformation. That will not be on boards because that gives away what it is. So that's a, that'll most likely be on the test. So you better know what diastomatomyelia means. Okay, and that's all we'll say. Um, here is the actual case of it, uh, where a patient had diastomatomyelia, and this is an MRI cut. It's a sagittal cut uh, through the thoracic region. You can see ribs starting to form here, or rib formations here. Oh, this is upper. There's the kidneys right there. So this is probably T12-ish, T11, or probably T12-ish. Anyway, um, you can clearly see a huge thecal sac here. All the white is cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, this is a T2-weighted MRI, as it says up here, which shows, oh, it doesn't say up here, but T2-weighting, as you probably learned in spinal anatomy, is uh, white. Anything with water content shows up white. So this is cerebral spinal fluid. And we have two spinal cords, which is uh, very weird. And these patients have all kinds of trouble with with Things like neurogenic bladder, cauticoinus syndrome, where they can't control their bladder and they have to catheterize or they have to have a background to catch their urine. They have all kinds of motor problems, low back pain with radiating leg pain. They may have positive neurological exam, sensation loss, motor loss. I mean, so these patients could potentially come into your office. That's why this is an important topic, the diastomatomyelia. Uh, Will, I, don't, I can't say it will be on boards for sure, but it's pretty high yield stuff. Uh, some fun facts about it. It's, it's often associated with scoliosis, specifically one called congenital scoliosis. What does congenital mean? That means from birth. Okay, so that's a big number. 70% are affected with some type of scoliosis. And this is uh, a patient of mine couple years ago uh, with low back pain, very young child. And if you look, you can see the vertebral bodies here. You can see the heart. This is an A to P view. You keep looking, 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 but then you start seeing some weird things. Look at that. What in the world is that thing? Looks like a little egg, but look, it's attached to a rib. Okay, I don't know if you've got this yet, but now you have. That's called a hemivertebrae. 
A hemivertebrae is a half vertebrae uh, that doesn't go all the way across. And the spine is basically a block, bunch of building or a bunch of vertebrae stacked like building blocks. So if you squeeze a hemivertebrae in one side but not the other, it's going to cause cause a wicked curve to start. And that's what's happened here. We have another one up here, another uh, type of hemivertebrae. There it is right there. You can see its pedicle. That little eye is the pedicle. Um, and the one above is mutated in such a way that they've kind of formed a huge triangle here. But you can see there's no pedicle here. Pedicle, pedicle. So that's one vertebrae. Pedicle, no pedicle. So that's another hemivertebrae. Okay, so it's caused a pretty bad a curve. People with congenital scoliosis, you have to be really careful. You have, usually have other congenital problems with the heart and kidneys and such. Uh, but this one did have split spinal cord and they also had a congenital scoliosis and the poor little uh, kid had all trouble with sciatica and all kinds of uh, back pain and weakness, having trouble walking, just a really sad story. And they had questions about surgery and what to do because we had a lot of compression of the both of the spinal cords and then we have compression here uh, but bottom line is that it's associated with congenital scoliosis and you should know what usually forms a congenital scoliosis is called a hemivertebrae and that's hemi means half it's like a half a vertebrae okay all right meet the nodal cord plate uh, so we've formed the neuroenteric canal, uh, and the and the gene products have traded places that need to trade place. So you got some in the amniotic cavity, some down in the secondary yolk sac. We get a switching of genetic material floating around, and that's uh, we won't get into that, uh, but that's been accomplished. And now we need to close that hole so we can properly form a spinal cord. So how do we do that? That's the next thing we're going to do. And what happens is uh, that, well, let's just go to the picture. I like pictures. Uh, we start, We what we've done is we've collapsed the roof of our little, uh, our little tunnel here. So these cells have just dropped down and they've plugged the hole right here. So now Ant-Man is stuck in one, one of these chambers and can't go all the way through. And then pretty soon these endoderm cells will grow back together and really strengthen this. Uh, but it's the dropping of this roof under the floor that, that first plugs it, as we said. Okay, it kind of acts as a band-aid to cover that endoderm hole. So pretty straightforward. Um, yep, oh, and there we up through a slide in that showed the endoderm now by mitosis, these cells uh, replace the hole. So this is really strong now. We're not going to have any more leakage in there now. Okay, so now we have a flat plate, and this is just flat. We can't see it from overhead, but trust me, it's flat. We need to form a tube. So the next thing that happens is we need to bend the sides of this up uh, to start to reform the tube. And I took all the crazy stuff out of that. So we're just going to keep it simple so you just bend the sides up this was flat and now it's bending up like that and we won't get into the mechanism to do that okay so we're reforming our our tube tubular nodal cord and there we've completely reformed it uh, and great so the tube is sealed off here at the top um, it does detach from the ectoderm and the endoderm this is showing it still stuck here it kind of lifts off but that which is not really important um, but it does do that and then what happens is the cells on the outside here by mitosis they start dividing and they start filling in this hollow tube until we get a solid structure once this tube is filled with a solid structure these cells in here are mature a very stem cell like they have the ability to induce other cells that pass by or, or are associated with them to do things. So they're very powerful in forming new tissue. And this is the final stage of the, the nodal cord, and it's called the definitive nodal cord. Definitive nodal cord. And so we have kind of a sandwich. There we have our ectoderm. It used to be epiblast, now it's ectoderm. And there's our 
used to be hypoblast, morphed into endoderm here. Mesoderm I didn't color in, but mesoderm is all around this. But it's not here because it's in the center there's just the solid cord. So definitive always means final. Okay, so we've made our nodal cord. Great. So any questions out there? Anybody want to shout out? Or we must be good. All right, if you joined us late, remember I can't see the screen. So if you have a question, just turn on your mic and let me have it. And I will wait after this is over. I'll hang around to see if there's questions. All right, great. So we formed our nodal cord. We looked at some pathology already called diastematomyelia. And there's more nodal cord pathology that we need to talk about. Oops, let's see. Hopefully you can still hear me. Okay. All right, a um, little spinal cord, or this might be spinal anatomy refresher for you. Uh, so the nodal cord, as we said before, it degenerates away. It's not a permanent structure. But a little bit of the nodal cord is used to make the nucleus propulsus of the disc. And that's the disc is very important. You're going to treat thousands of patients over your career with disc problems. And where did that nucleus come from? It came from basically little pieces of the nodal cord that didn't degenerate degenerate away. But there is a connection, we believe, about the nodal, uh, between the nodal cord and low back pain. So let's look into that a little bit. So nodal cord will degenerate away, as we said, except for a little bit of tiny piece, a little tiny pieces, and those tiny pieces go on to form the nucleus propulsus. So when you're born, you have nucleus, the nucleus propulsus cells are actually little pieces of nodal cord. They're called nodal cordal cells. And they do what, what all nucleus propulsus cells do, even in you guys, they're still doing it. Uh, they're little proteoglycan factories. And they spit out through the central dogma a, a material called a proteoglycan. And proteoglycan is like SpongeBob. It absorbs water like crazy. Um, that's why, because we have such a high content normally of proteoglycan in the nucleus, it's about 80% water. But then something really weird happens at the age of about 10. Somewhere during the first decade of life, these notochord cells, they degenerate away and are replaced with a, a new type of cell. So this new type of cell, it's kind of like, some authors say it's a chondrocyte like cell. Some say it's a fibroblast-like cell. We'll go with standring, which is the big Gray's anatomy. We'll call it a chondrocyte-like cell. And that takes over the job of making proteoglycans. It's not actually as good at making proteoglycans as the nodal cordal cells were. But it still works pretty good, and most uh, humans do pretty good, and they won't get horrible degeneration because the cells will keep working, but they're not as good as the original cells. But there's an interesting point here that some authors believe. Since these new cells popped up at the age of 10, that was way before our immune systems formed. And the immune system may not recognize these cells, the theory goes. Well, why wouldn't they recognize the cells? I mean, they're in the body. There's no immune system in the middle of your disc, right? There's no blood vessels in the middle of your disc. There's no lymph. It's like a wasteland. It's like the cornea of the eye. There's nothing there. So therefore, the, the immune system has never seen these cells before. And as long as you don't rip the center of your disc open and allow these cells to escape, you're probably no big deal. But as you'll learn as you go through this program, some people have tears in the disc. That's called the annular tear. And some people have horrible pain, so much pain that you won't be able to fix them, and they'll end up having a fusion to remove the disc. And here's the, here's the big mystery. Some people can have tears in the disc 
and they have zero pain at all. It doesn't even bother them. And so we still don't know the answer, but one of the theories why some people are sensitive and other people aren't is maybe those new chondrocyte-like cells have, for whatever reason, their immune system doesn't know who they are, and they get in the outer portion of the disc, and an inflammation occurs. They think they're a virus or something, an attack. And for whatever reason, other people, maybe they some the immune system does recognize them. So these cells have the potential, these new chondrocyte-like cells that pop up at the age of 10, they have the ability to act like a foreign invader. And a fancy word to say foreign invader is antigenic. Uh, so these new chondrocytes or fibroblast-like cells, uh, they have the ability to be antigenic. And, and that means to act like a virus or a foreign invader. And then when they get to the outer portion of the disc, you remember from spinal anatomy, is filled with blood vessels, and your body will see them up, uh, after that time. Okay, so let's look at that again. I got a whole bunch of pictures coming up. Um, that is everything I just said right there. And if the, if the sinovertebral nerves in the back of the disc get set off, most humans experience that as horrible low back pain. And that pain can refer down into the SI joints, very commonly does, into the butt and into the anterolateral thigh. In fact, it can look like that Morelgia parasthetica, remember the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve? Can't remember if you guys had that yet. You probably have had that in anatomy, uh, but very difficult to tell that referred pain uh, from a compression of lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So why is this so important? According to research, the number one cause of chronic low back pain is a rip within the disc. You probably won't treat tons of these patients. Most of the people that come into our offices are facet problems. They have fixations. Their, their facet joints are locked up. The subluxation, right? That's called the subluxation. Some people call it fixations. Everybody has something different for it. Uh, but that's not the number one. And this is not someone who just has low back pain. They picked up a pencil. Oh, I hurt my back. Or they lifted a couch. I hurt my back. That might even be muscular pain. These are people who come in and they've had pain for six months and they've tried everything and you, they can't get rid of the pain. It's very difficult to treat a tear within the disc. Um, I figured at this point we should refresh some spinal anatomy. This should be really easy because I'm sure you've had this picture before. But if you haven't, this is on board, so you got to know this stuff. Uh, so let's just go through this real quickly. Um, I guess I can do it on the side. Well, we can do it. I put the answers right there. Oops. But let's go through this. Um, so, and I should have put what these are. The Number one, this would be the annulus fibrosis. Uh, but I should have put lamellae. Remember, the annulus fibrosis is made up of about anywhere from 15 to 20 rings of collagen called lamellae. Number two is the nucleus propulsus. Number three, you should definitely know the name of this because this is the number one cause of chronic low back pain is an irritation of these things. And these are the sinovertebral nerves. Sometimes it's called recurrent meningeal nerve as an AKA. Uh, but bring that back to your memories. Number four, these are also sinovertebral nerves. So they, they, enter, they innervate number 17, which is the dural sac or thecal sac, which goes all the way up to the foramen magnum, and it tapers down at about S2 and ends. But it's a sac that holds the cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, uh, number five is dorsal root ganglia. That's a sensory part of the nerve root. Number six is the motor part of the nerve root. Okay, those should be reversed too. The little bump should be down here. But yeah, I mean, they can float around in here differently so uh, number seven this is the spinal nerve right the sensory root and the motor root in the in the intervertebral frame and come together to form this short little section called the spinal nerve spinal nerve you you know that word but it's not a very impressive structure it's really short and it immediately splits 
into a ventral division and a dorsal division. So this is called the ventral ramus. Number nine is called the dorsal ramus, right? Number nine is really important to us because it, it branches into a medial branch and a lateral branch and sometimes an intermediate branch. This one is really, I'll probably test you on this one. This is the medial branch of the posterior ramus or dorsal ramus. Why do we care about the medial branch of the dorsal ramus? This is the one that gives sensation to the facet joint or the Z joint or the zygapothecial joint. Okay, so this is really clinically important. When people come in and you palpate them and you do motion palpation and you find a, a, a joint that's stuck and not moving, where's the pain coming from? It's coming right down the medial branch right here. Okay, um, some people have chronic facet pain and you can't fix them. And it's like a knee that's worn out. You can't, some people just have to have knee replacements because the cartilage is gone. I mean, we can't fix everything. Um, and the same thing can happen here. The cartilage can be gone in the facet joint and you can adjust them as much as you want, but they always have pain because there's no cartilage. They, and there's no artificial joint to be put in here. If the pain is severe enough, they have to have fusion and have this fused so it stops moving around. But the pain is coming down that medial branch. Uh, so that's important. Before you go to the extreme of fusion, there is a procedure called a rhizotomy where they can try to burn away the medial branch here, uh, which works really good for most people. But the trouble is these nerves regrow uh, within about a year and they try it again and it doesn't work so good. Um, let's keep going. So we have the fecal sac, aka dural sac. We have nerve roots inside the thecal sac. The ones in the top corners are always the root lower. If this is the L4 disc, then this is the L5 nerve root. This is all L4 nerve root coming out here then. Um, the, let's see, what else can I show you? 17 we did, how about 18? Where's 18? Okay, let's get over here then. So attached to the ventral ramus, uh, we have this thing, number three. Uh, that is the the gray ramus communicantes. Oh, do we have two number threes? We do, don't we? We should make that like 23. Well, I'm probably not going to test you on this stuff. Maybe I'll ask you one question on this, and it's probably going to be sinovertebral nerves or medial branch what else would I test you on? Those are the most important ones to me. Um, yeah, I know you guys know what the lamellae are and the nucleus, but you may not know these sinovertebral. So make sure you know sinovertebral nerves. Make sure you know medial branch of the posterior ramus. I think that's probably enough. Uh, but this is sympathetic territory, right? Here's a lumbar sympathetic ganglia. Um, this is a sympathetic afferent fibers, which innervate the front portion of the disc. Is the front portion of the disc a pain generator? Do these carry the sensation of pain? Research says no. So if you have a tear in the front part of the disc, probably no big deal. Okay, um, they do have proprioceptive function though, so they help us, our bodies know where they are in space. All right, I think that's good enough. So sinovertebral nerves, there's the main trunk of the sinovertebral nerve right here. And the reason it's called recurrent meningeal nerve is an AKA, because if you get an inflammation in these nerve roots and they send a signal of pain, it goes out of the intervertebral foramen, comes back into the ventral ramus, and then it turns around and comes right back in. So it re-enters or reoccur, that's where reoccurrent, like the reoccurrent laryngeal nerve, how it comes out of the neck into the thoracic cavity and goes back out of the thoracic cavity. That's a re, another reoccurrent. Okay, so that's enough of that. All right, so, yep, there we go. So make sure you know medial branch, make sure you know sign of vertebral nerves, and I didn't put lamella in there, so I guess I can't test you on that. I won't ask what levels which and things like that. All right, let's move on. 
Okay, so, and remember, we're talking about these notochordal cells. So this is like someone your age, and these are no longer notochordal cells. Now, these are chondrocyte-like cells. They're still producing proteoglycan. The original notochordal cells are long gone. And this is a, a lateral cut or sagittal cut through the center of the disc. You can see annulus fibrosis. Remember, and maybe I should go back here. I'm, I just assume you know this stuff. Remember, only the very outer periphery of the annulus is innervated by nerves and blood vessels. I didn't draw the blood vessels in because it clouds the picture too much. For every one of these nerves, there's a blood vessel. So inside the disc, there's nothing. The outer two, th the inner two thirds of the disc, there's nothing. If you get a rip right here, you won't even know it because there's no way to sense it. If you rip all the way out into here, then there's a chance you can feel it. All right, so here's the setup. There's all those nerves. There's the peripheral blood vessels. They're kind of clouded here. But here's the theory of, of annular tears is where we're going with this. Um, so you're out playing rugby and you twist your back and something happens and it just, you have pain and it doesn't get better, it doesn't get better. What one of the theories is, is that these, these chondrocyte-like nucleus propulsus cells which the body doesn't know who they are, they actually go through the annular tear and they get out into the part of the disc where the where the bloodstream is and where the immune system is. And now the body goes, oh, wait a minute, who are these people? We don't know who they are. We better call in the troops. So here comes the monocytes and lymphocytes and neutrophils and the whole white cells. Gang comes in here and gets a rip-roaring inflammation going. The inflammation sets off these centervertebral nerves, and you have a horrible pain developing. And there's another theory. Did I list that? I think I did somewhere. Maybe I didn't. I think I did. Maybe it's coming. There's another theory that in people with degenerative disc disease, uh, that you can have molecules called cytokines in here, especially one called tumor necrosis factor alpha. Tumor necrosis factor alpha is a wicked, it's like gasoline, and that is found in degenerative tissue, especially in the nucleus propulsus. So that's another theory of how this annular tear can create pain, is these degenerated cells, or these, these tumor necrosis factor alpha cells get out here, and they just spark an inflammation all by themselves. And then, of course, you know about the biomechanics of the disc, uh, where normally, in a normal setup, the axial load of the body passes right through the center of the nucleus propulsus. So the annulus, there's not a lot of pressure on these nerves. If you rip the disc open, we lots of cadaver studies on this. If you rip, rip the disc open, the axial load shifts right over the back of the disc where the inflammation is starting. So you get a grinding type motion here. Oh, and it also jams the facets and irritates the facet joints as well. So, yeah, so those are the two theories of annular tears. So we can have cytokines leaking out, sparking an inflammation. Uh, maybe some of these are antigenic. That sparks an inflammation. And then we have a shift because of the tear, the axial load shifts over the back. So that should be, you should be familiar with all that stuff from spinal anatomy. If not, I'm sure you'll get it, get it somewhere. If it's not on the slide, I'm not going to test you. So, uh, but there's a, I tried to draw like an inflammation right here. And, oh, there it is. So pro-inflammatory molecules called cytokines live in the nucleus propulsus, and they can also spark the inflammation as well. I didn't put the thing about the shift. Maybe next quarter I'll do that. Depending on if you guys have never heard that before, I will. All right. Um, how do you test for, what is the test you can order to see if the disc is ripped? So you got a patient, you've tried everything, they've tried all conservative care, they're, they can't work, they're going to lose their house, and they're asking you, what do I do, what do I do? You can order a test called discography. It's called provocative discography. And don't do this test unless they're really disabled and they can't work because this will damage the disc and probably about 75% of the people who get this test, it will cause degeneration in the disc. 
Um, so this is only a, a, if if they're going to lose their house, they can't work. They have to get rid of this pain. So, uh, but it's a pretty cool test. So you stick a needle inside the disc and you fill it up with a white stuff called contrast. And then you take an x-ray or it's usually done under fluoroscopy. And you can see from the, the radiographic image, you can see what the nucleus looks like. And it usually looks like this little kind of sea-like looking thing. The key is you do not want to see big rips in the disc. If there's a rip here, this could fill right up uh, with, with contrast, or it could rip out the front. It could leak out into the back. And so not only do you look at it, you also can pump, uh, you can pump contrast in here hard, uh, and you can get, it has a pressure sensor in here, so it senses how much pressure you put in. And you can pressurize the disc uh, up to about 75 PSI, like a mountain bike tire almost, and see what happens. And don't tell the patient you're doing this. So you, if you pump it up and you get up to 30, and all of a sudden they start saying, oh my gosh, whatever you're doing, stop it. It's really hurting my back. That's a pretty good indication that the disc is the pain generator. That's where the provocative comes in. So not only do you have to see the tear, you have to be able to provoke the pain, and it has to be their usual and customary pain. There's people who don't do this test correctly, who pressurize up to 150. Everybody's going to have pain up that high. And back in the, I even had a client who had this done, and they actually blew the disc out during the procedure. So they have to be careful not to overpressurize the disc. Okay, but that's discography. Um, here's a client I had a couple years ago who had low back pain. Their MRI didn't look that bad. And this is actually a work comp case, if I remember correctly. And the insurance was denying everything because the MRI was normal. The disc was dark and degenerated. The facets looked fantastic. So it wasn't a facet joint problem. But I said, oh, this is easy. It's probably a tear in the disc, which you can't see on MRI. So we ordered a discography study, and here's the results. And you can see the nucleus, you can see the dye drained out of the nucleus. So it drained all the way through here. So there's a huge annular tear here. And there's a perfect ship anchor tear. That's called a grade 5 radial annular tear. A perfect example of one. Um, so the in, patient ended up having the Tiger Woods procedure and did really good. They had a small disability at the end of it, but they did really good from it. Um, here's a sa side view. You can also see the rip right through the back. And you can see that it's actually leaking right out the back uh, into the epidural space. So that certainly demonstrated the pathology, recreated pain. And um, yeah, so it's kind of a look into what happens when you can't fix people. You guys got to try all your powers to fix people because this is a, I mean, these are some, I don't want to say they're dangerous procedures, but they're, they're like real significant procedures. All right, let's get back to more embryology stuff now. So what happens if a big piece of the nodal cord, a big piece of the nodal cord doesn't degenerate? degenerate away. Sim this is very similar to the primitive streaks story. Remember we said uh, primitive streaks that that stay behind can form those teratoma tumors. Same story here. If you don't degenerate all of the nodal cord, except for those little tiny pieces that make up the nucleus, if you don't degenerate away the no nodal cord, you can have a nasty, nasty tumor. And this one is always cancerous. Remember, the teratomas were not always cancerous, but these are always cancerous. So this is called the chordoma. Chordoma. Make sure you I almost guarantee you this is coming on the test. So um, it's rare. About 2% of all uh, bone tumors are chordoma origin, uh, but they're rare. It's way more rare than Marfan, Marfan syndrome. Uh, but they arise only in the spine. So you're, they're not seen anywhere else. They can also be in the sacral region, just like the teratomas. Uh, they can also be in the cranial region. They look like polyps. Typically don't show up and start causing trouble uh, until the age of 50 or so. 
So you could have these things cooking and not even know it. 50% uh, of them are in the sacral region, so it's its favorite place. It's a, it likes to invade soft tissue, which is a way, a way of saying it likes to metastasize. So about 40% of the tumors that are already cancerous, they metastasize. They can get into the blood and get up in your brain, and they can get to your heart and livers and lungs. And they can get everywhere. Um, in the cranial region, again, they have a tendency to invade the, the nasopharynx, and they look like polyps when they do that. Uh, and polyps, those are, well, you know, the, I don't know if you know, you haven't had pathology yet, but those are common tumors that occur in the nasal uh, pharynx, which look like little, let's see, what would that look like? Little worms, I guess, although they're not moving, uh, but they're little kind of projections. They're like little appendixes. All right. So, for example, here is a side view, a sagittal view of a sacrum. There's the L5 disc. We can see S1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Okay. We can see everything great. There's the coccyx right there, the first segment of the coccyx. Now look at this patient. So there's the L5 disc. There's S1. Uh-oh, where's the rest of the sacrum? That is a sacral coccygeal chordoma. So that's a chordoma that's occurred. And when the histologist, histologist gets a hold of it and, and studies the cell types, it comes back to notochord. These don't, because uh, they don't, they're not a hodgepodge of different tissues. You don't have hair and teeth and muscle and heart muscle and uh, you don't have all that story going on. Uh, they're just cancerous notochordal cells. Okay, let's do a quiz here. So this is a 33-year-old patient who comes in your clinic. She's got SI joint pain. She says that word because she's been on the internet and she has pain right in the SI joint. And you take your chiropractic x-ray just to be safe because this pain's been going on for six months. If the pain just started a couple weeks ago, you don't need to take an x-ray in this case. If pain's been going on for six months and no one's taken an x-ray, it's insane in my opinion not to take an x-ray. But what do you think? Ooh, so I know what some of you are thinking. SI joint. So you look at this is the right side. This is the left side. You look at the left SI joint. I know what some of you are thinking. Oh, look, there's a, what's that big black thing? It must be a tumor, right? It's not a tumor. If you look, you can see the cortex. There's the ala of the sacrum. You can see the SI joint. That's just a big gas bubble right there. What's that thing, by the way? IUD. IUD. Got it. Good job. Yep, so that's a birth control device. Um, did anybody see the problem? Always follow the cortexes. So let's see. Uh, this is the, what's this bone called, by the way? There's the ilium, the ischium, the pubic bone. What's the whole thing called? Coxal bone, AKA anominate bone. Or ase coxae, another aka. Coxal bone is a good word for all of that. So that looks okay. Femoral heads look okay. There's the acetabulum. That looks fine. Symphus pubis looks a little funky. It's probably fecal material. Let's look at the sacrum. Follow the sacrum down. There's S1. That's S1, 2, 3, 4. Uh oh. Where's the rest of the sacrum? You should be able to see the cortex come down. So it's gone, it's destroyed. This is a gigantic chordoma here. Uh, that it's kind of tricky because it kind of looks like fecal material, but you should be able to see the sacrum. It shouldn't just disappear like that. So you can see, you can, yeah, that's why radiology is a very tough class to get through because you can't miss stuff like that. Okay, so that's the end of the nodal cord. Uh, normally we would take a break, but let's just go right through this and be done with it. Okay, so neurulation, last topic. So this is the process of forming the neural tube, which we've talked a little bit about. Um, 
it's happening. It starts again in the third week. So we've got a lot of stuff going on in this third week. But nerdulation, key note cardable messages, nerdulation formation of is the very first step in forming the brain and spinal cord. Okay, and the very first step of nerdulation is the formation of the neural plate. Neural plate. That's when it starts, and it ends when the neural plate folds up into a tube. And those are called neural... Uh, the, the tube, the, the open, the superior and inferior ends of the tube where they're open, those are called neural pores. The, tu the tube starts to form in the middle of the neural plate, which would be the next lecture, which we're not going to get to. But So it starts with the formation of the neural plate, it ends with the closure of the ends of the tube. And those ends of the tube where the openings are called neural pores. It's usually closed by week four. There's four stages of neurulation. We're going to form the neural plate. We are going to elongate the neural plate to make a key-like structure. Then we're going to fold this flat key-like structure up into folds. And then we're going to seal the folds, or we're going to round the folds out to create a tube and seal it at the top. And while we do this, we're going to form some tissue that's incredibly important. And these are called neural crest cells. Neural crest cells. They're so important. Remember we talked about the three germ layers, how important they're super duper stem cells. They can form any tissue. One that's very close to that is the neural crest cell. Some call the, this the fourth the fourth germ cell layer, the neural crest cells. They're so, so important. All right, let's look at let's look at making the plate first. So about day 18, the nodal cord is mature now. A primitive streak is still degenerating away. Remember this primitive streak is degenerating backwards while the nodal cord is kind of being formed as it De degenerate so it's almost like one structure in a way so both of these tissues have the ability to uh, secrete some very important growth factors and other types of molecules we won't get into all of those names but they secrete chemicals that soak upward into the ectoderm cells they go into those cells they go into the nucleus and they turn on some genes and they manipulate those genes and it causes those cells to morph into neural ectoderm cells. Okay, and we'll look at that process a little bit more right now. But here's kind of the, the big picture. So nodal cord is right here. Could have been primitive streak. I could have put a cut through. They release chemicals that soak upward and they soak into these cells that are on the top of the trilaminar disc. Those are the ectoderm cells. They soak into them, into the nucleus, into the genes, and they turn on genes which cause these ectoderm cells to morph into a cell that's capable of creating brain and spinal cord, and those are called neural ectoderm cells. Okay, everybody good with that? Okay, this process of morphing, because these are epidermal cells, the ectoderm, uh, still ecto, these are epiderm, or these are uh, epithelial type cells. But now we're going to have neural type cells, so that's, we're, we're not, these are not going to be epithelial type cells anymore. So uh, we have a name for that. And where did it go? Oh, here it is. So that conversion of this epithelial tissue into a neural tissue is called neural induction. So the process of neural induction starts forming the neural plate. Okay, and collectively these new cells make up the neural ectoderm. So neural ectoderm cells make up the neural ectoderm. Neural ectoderm is the neural plate. So at this point the neural ectoderm is flat, so it's called a neural plane. A neural plate, and that's the very first step 
in the formation of the central nervous system. What's the central nervous system? Brain and spinal cord. Okay, so the plate starts forming up here at first. So this is the cranial end, and there's the caudal end, cloacal uh, membrane is here, um, AV cells, everything's up there in front. So it's a flat plate up here. Okay, um, you could say with regard to location, where does the neural plate first form? Well, we, it forms between the that little knot on the primitive streak. Remember what that is? That's the primitive node, and it, and the oropharyngeal membrane. You could say AVE cells. Remember, there's a bunch of structures up here as well. The precordal plate is up here as well. So, but we'll just go with primitive node and oropharyngeal membrane. Remember that becomes your mouth. All right, so that's where it forms between. And who are the players involved in this, this morphing of tissue into a neural structure? It's actually four uh, tissues involved. We talked about nodal cord and primitive streak, or primitive uh, node of the primitive streak. Those are the main players. Precordal plate helps, and the AVE cells also help in the neurulation story. Well, you got to watch out for these slides. Isn't it so easy for me to make a test question when I see that? All of the following are involved in the process of neurulation, except for blank, notochord, primitive node, precordal plate, posterior visceral endoderm. Sounds like me, doesn't it? There's no such thing as the posterior visceral endoderm, so that would be the that would be the wrong answer. Um, so what's the trick? We're not going to go crazy into all these these chemicals that are released, uh, but there is one I want you to know. So the trick to make a neural endoderm cell is to turn off something. So if you turn off the bone morphogenetic protein 4 gene, if you turn off the gene, you can't make the bone morphogenetic protein 4 gene product. So that's what you got to do. All the cells we've talked about in all the germ layers have BMP4 turned on. It's a very common gene to be turned on. We don't talk about it much, but it's kind of weird to turn it off. If you turn this gene off anywhere, um, it'll make it'll it'll make the default tissue of that cell. It'll make the default cell type, and the default cell type is actually a neural ectoderm cell. So if you want to make, here's the note card. How do you make a neuroectoderm cell? What gene has to be turned off? Bone morphogenetic protein 4 needs to be turned off. Simple as that. Uh, who turns it off? Oh, this this little nerdy guy. I mean, that's kind of good note card material. There's three. There's three types of uh, genes that have to be activated in the gene products turn off BMP4. So the notochord and the primitive node all secrete these three. Uh, Nagin, Cordin, that's from the primitive node, and Cerberus 1, uh, that one comes from the notochord and the AVE cells and the precordal plate as well. So Okay, so what is the, we already said this, what does the neural plate do? Oh, it's going to roll up into a tube and basically form your brain, spinal cord, and these very important neural crust cells. All right, step two. So we got a plate formed, but our spinal cord is long. So far we have a plate which will become the brain, but we don't really have a spinal cord. So we got to form, we got to stretch this thing out and elongate it. And that's exactly what it does. Uh, so here's the plate that we just formed up in the cranial end uh, of the little human. What happens next is cells start via mitosis. They start duplicating and they start spitting out the bottom. But something weird happens. Why isn't it as wide as it is up here? It actually comes out very narrow. Um, and there's a 
we need to talk about how that that happens. It's much more tapered and much more narrow here, the spinal port, cord portion of this neural plate. Um, and in fact, the there's a word, the process of creating this kind of caudal extension of the neural plate um, that is accomplished by a process called convergent extension. So convergent extension extends the wide neural plate at the cranial region of the embryonic disc. When I say embryonic disc, I mean the trilaminar disc. I mean, that's the little human. It's a flat little human right now. But convergent extension makes it extend caudally. And it's more narrow, we said. Uh, why is it? The new cells that are formed are very strongly hooked together and pulled together and even overlapped. Um, that's called intercalation, or they intercalate with each other. So intercalation is the formation of a structure that is very narrow. Okay, so now we have this set up. So we have our brain will be up with the original neural plate, and convergent extension is extending this back as the as the primitive streak is degenerating away. Um, this is it follows this whole setup backwards. Okay, um, remember all of these cells, is BMP4 turned on in any of these yellow cells? Nope. Is BMP4 turned on in these blue cells? Yep. Those cells are BMP4 is still on. All right, so we have a flat plate. Now what do we have to do? Well, our brain and spinal cord, especially our spinal cord, is round. We can't have a flat spinal cord. So we need to start making it more round looking. That means we have to bend the plate. And the very first thing that happens about day 18 is that it starts to bend. The middle, the very center of the precordal plate starts to cave in and go down. And we'll see how that happens here in a second. But we start to get some lateral folds developed here. And so there's a lot of mechanisms. I took all this stuff out. I think that's, we don't need to go that deep into it. Uh, just know that they can't, how does this folding happen? They don't really know for sure. They used to think back in the day it was one single mechanism, which I completely took out, because it's now apparent that there's many different processes involved in this, this folding process. So we'll just leave it at that. But here's something you can remember. The very first thing that happens in this flat neural plate made of rectangular cells is the cells in the very midline of the plate, they start becoming pizza, like a slice of pizza shaped. And they get very narrow here at the tip. And then here, they're their normal size. This used to be a rectangle. And you see how it's pinched in right here on the sides, like a slice of pizza. So how in the world does that happen? Um, and you could say pyramid instead of triangular. Um, but yeah, so how does that happen? So here's the key right here. So this was a flat plate a second ago. We're looking at a kind of a kind of a cranial to caudal S to I type view, a cross-sectional view. And we can see that these cells are rectangular out here in the plate. They all used to be like that. But now look at these ones in the middle. They're starting to look like little, little pieces of pizza. And specifically, this, uh, this end right here, this would be the dorsal end, they have really crunched together. So what is going on there? It's created this triangular-like shape. But if you create a triangle here, what's going to happen to the flat plate? It's going to cave in. It's going to push in toward the, the mesoderm. So the question is, why do these cells become pyramid in shape or, or pizza slice shaped? And here's, I took all the genes out except the main one. And luckily it's easy to remember. It's the shroom gene that does this. So we won't worry about how it gets turned on, but cells in the nucleus here, uh, genes in the nucleus, the shroom gene wakes up and starts secreting the gene of the shroom gene product. Sh shroom gene product is made 
uh, out here by ribosomes, and it goes to the the apex of these cells or the dorsal portion of these cells, and it causes the actin myosin filaments that happen to be in here in the cytoskeleton to squish together and pull together really hard. The shroom product does not affect this region at all. It only goes to the apical or the part where the amniotic cavity is, or you could say the dorsum, the dorsal part, and it affects uh, the cytoskeleton where it pulls in really hard. And shroom is an actin uh, binding protein and, it, and actin is made up of those, those filaments and it pulls them together and narrows the apex in that mechanism. Okay, um, so this bending part right here, that's got a name. It's called the median hinge point median hinge point, right? So now we have kind of a flying V-like structure. So here's where we were, flat rectangular uh, cells, neuroectoderm cells. But now shroom is turned on here in the middle. We have our pizzas in here, and it's pushing this downward. Okay, so that's where we are. It's not a tube yet, but it's certainly a lot better than a plate. And we have some structures. We have a neural groove that's formed right here. Um, and this, this bending point is called the median, not medial, median hinge point. Median hinge point. Are we good? Looks like we're good. A new form of cell has started to morph right here in the very end of the neural plate. That's those very important neural crust cells have just started to form. Um, those, well, we won't see today, but as this, as this bending process occurs here next, and then it occurs basically everywhere to make ourselves a tube here. Just before the tube closes, these will migrate. They, they develop the ability to migrate, and they pull right out of here all by themselves. So they get out before the tube closes. Those would be those neural crust cells. Okay, so yep, so neural plate is sinking in. Let's look at that. Is it sinking in? Remember, mesoderm is here. There's notochord, lives in the mesoderm layer. So it's pushing into the mesoderm here. Um, yep, and then another thing is happening. So here's the ectoderm, and this used to be ectoderm, but it turned into the neural plate. So we really lost ectoderm cells. These guys sense that they've lost a bunch of cells. They need to be replaced. So these start splitting by mitosis and split and split and split. And they were going to reform the ectoderm layer. And as these two reform and push inward, it pushes this down into the mesoderm. So ectoderm will reform and it helps push the neural tube downward. And so there's the ectoderm ectoderm cell regrowth is pushing this way and neural plate is dropping lower and lower here and pretty soon we're going to get that same pizza story here uh, and basically everywhere in here until it forms up into a tube and it's shroom is the one who does this the shroom gene if you've got a mutation in your sh the shroom gene you're not going to have a sprain or spinal cord so the baby won't make it uh, but it's really important for a shroom gene to be turned on uh, next, we get lateral hinge points, uh, which the shroom gene gets turned on right here in the lateral regions and starting to be turned on up here. Pretty soon, shroom is going to be on basically everywhere here, and it's going to form a nice circle. And that's our, our tubic structure. There's our neural crust cells. Um, they're, they're getting ready to migrate out of here. They don't want to be trapped inside the neural tube. They get put on the outside. Um, but yeah, that's everything I said about the neural crust cells. Um, yep, everything I said about them, really important, so important that they're called the fourth germ layer. I always ask that question about the fourth germ layer. So make sure you know who the fourth germ layer is. Neural crust cells are the fourth germ layer. Super, super important. What are the germ, what are, what are these neural crust cells? become a whole bunch of stuff. But if I could only pick one answer, and you should know this for the test, 
they basically are going to form almost all of your nerves and all of the ganglia that go with those nerves. Very important structure. All right, so that's enough for your brains. I can't remember if I gave you this bird or not, but it's a good bird to end with. Uh, this is a white-tailed kite, and it gets the name because if you look around, you'll see they're quite common in fields. They hover over one place, and they have these dark feathers here, and they look like some giant pterodactyl, and they scare the little rodents underneath. They see this thing hovering over them. They run, and the second they run, they come down and they grab the gopher or the snake or whatever they go after. So those are called white tail kites. Oh, look, they have a white tail, so you can't miss that. Okay, so um, please, you guys, please do that survey. I just kind of found out about that, and they, they told me that people are getting, or instructors are getting written up if they don't get 50% student response. I'm like, what? Uh, so I really appreciate that. If you could put forth some constructive criticism and if, give me a thumbs up if you like the class and you know the drill. So I'll hang around after I shut down the shop here to see if there's any questions.